Hello, everyone, and greetings to everyone who's joining us online. My name is Father Dominic Holtz. I'm the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy at the Angelic the Pontifical In University of St. Thomas Aquinas. And on behalf of the Angelicum, I would like to invite you to our today's lecture in the John Paul II lecture series organized by the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, which is housed here at our Faculty of Philosophy at the Angelicum in Rome. This lecture, as well as the entire John Paul II lecture series, could not have taken place without the support of our university authority. I want to mention in particular, Father Michal Paluch, who is the rector of the Angelic, Father Serge Toma Bonino, the Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy, and Father Richard Ribka, the director of the John Paul II Institute of Culture. And these I would like to thank in a special and particular way. I also want to thank in another particular way, the founders of the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, namely the St. Nicholas Foundation, whose president, Darius Karovic, is with us today and the Futura Juventa Foundation. I also want to thank and welcome the numerous donors who made this all possible, the supporters of the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, and all the viewers who are watching today in front of their screens. We look forward to the day when you will all be able to meet us and see one another in person here in the Eternal City. The St. John Paul II Institute of Culture was established to look at the challenges facing the modern world and the church in the light of the life and thought of John Paul II. The idea of thinking with John Paul II was embodied in these JP2 lecture series, which are a series of monthly lectures of notable interdisciplinary academics who will revisit the extraordinary contributions of John Paul II for our own day. Last month, we had the honor of hosting Professor Marek Chutotsky, um, where we listened to his lecture on the importance of distinguishing historical and cultural significance of the two axes dividing Europe, East-West and North-South. In our series, which we plan to continue for the entire academic year of 2020-2021, we will host renowned lecturers, including Francois Daguet, of the St. Thomas Aquinas Institute at Toulouse, Professor Chantal Del Sol of the University of Martin La Vallée and the Institute Hannah Arendt, Professor Rémi Brague, Professor Emeritus of the Sorbonne and the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, Professor Renato Christin of the Università degli Studi di Trieste, and finally, Professor Dariusz Gawin of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Now, I am pleased to give the floor to Dr. Dariusz Kowowicz, the president of the St. Nicholas Foundation. Um, and I also want to say, please myself to see someone whom I saw many years ago when I was a graduate student at Notre Dame. Um, but Dr. Dariusz will introduce and share with us more about today's. Uh, dear friends, um, I'm honored to introduce to you John Cavadini. Mm -hmm professor of theology at Notre Dame University and director of McGrath Institute for Church Life. He received his uh, doctorate in, in theology from Yale University. Um, in 2009, he was appointed by Pope Benedict XVI for a five-year term in the International Theological Commission. A professor is a member of the Notre Dame Department since 1990. A professor is a researcher of patristic theology and early medieval times. He is also involved in the theology of St. Augustine and the history of biblical and um, a patristic, uh, uh, and, uh, patristic um, uh, theology. Uh, uh, the topic uh, of um, today's lecture is uh, trajectories of Vatican II in the theology of St. John Paul II and the crisis of modernity, uh, in which Professor Cavadini will undertake the description of how John Paul 
the second develop the ideas of second Vatican Council uh, and judging in dialogue with contemporary culture. Professor Cavadini on selected examples from the encyclicals and writings of John Paul II will show how he strove to make the position of the church more understandable for the modern world and to create a model of dialogue that does not turn into relativism. Uh, Professor Cavadini, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalowitz and Father Holtz and the St. Nicholas Society. Thank you for welcoming me. It's nice to see all of you listening, even though I can't see you, um, but it's an honor to be here. I, I thought um, I chose the topic of this paper because there's been a lot of recent controversy, I guess, about the status of Vatican II. Um, then there's also controversy about uh, Pope St. John Paul II and his legacy and especially his connection to Vatican II. So I tried to um, put something together that would connect them and to think about how John Paul II received Vatican II and um, left a legacy with that reception. So that's where this paper is coming from. Okay, okay. So what is the crisis of modernity? To put it in terms of the Second Vatican Council, we can look specifically at Gaudium et Spes, which has the subtitle De Ecclesia in Mundo Quius Temporis. Usually this is translated into English as concerning the church in the modern world. If we take our cue from Gaudium et Spes, then we would say that the crisis of modernity is a crisis of the human being, a crisis of man or of the human person. Gaudium et Spes identifies the human person as the key to its whole discussion. It calls the human person the hinge of its exposition, that very human person who is to be saved and whose society is to be renewed. More specifically, Gaudium et Spes calls us to discern the sign of the times in this modern world, which is a new age in history, it says. It finds as one of the principal signs of these modern times, a spiritual turbulence or uneasiness, which stems on the one hand from a growing technical ability to achieve practical mastery over the natural world. And on the other hand, a disproportionate lack of moral and theoretical apparatus to make sure that the human being is able to control the forces unleashed by our growing technical mastery, rather than being paradoxically enslaved to them. The modern world displays itself as, as one that is at once powerful and weak, capable of doing what is noble and what is base, disposed to freedom and to slavery, progress and decline, amity and hatred from chapter nine. There is on the one hand, also chapter nine, a growing conviction that the human being is able and has the duty to strengthen its mastery over nature and that the benefits of this mastery should be widely available. And on the other hand, that these benefits are actually available only to the few and that many are unjustly deprived of them and that this is an affront to the dignity proper to individuals and to societies. Aware of these conflicting tendencies, Gaudi Mitzpez tells us that modern man questions himself. The questions are age old questions, but with a modern inflection. Here's a long quote. In the face of modern developments, there is a growing body of people who are asking the most fundamental of all questions or are glimpsing them with keener insight. What is man? What is the meaning of suffering, evil, death, which have not been eliminated by all this progress? What is the purpose of these achievements purchased at so high a price? What can people contribute to society? What can they expect from it? What happens after this earthly life is ended? God him its best 10. And all these questions are still very much alive now. You'll recognize them. 
The council then gives the church's fundamental answer to these questions, the answer which is able to illuminate the mystery of man. The church believes that the key, the center, and the purpose of the whole of human history is to be found in its Lord and Master, Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. After this introduction, laying out the basic problem and the basic approach to answering it, the first chapter of God and Spez specifies the church's answer more fully, this time focusing the question of the human being on the question of human dignity. Quote, enlightened by divine revelation, the church can offer a solution to these problems by which the true state of man may be described, his weakness explained in such a way that at the same time, his dignity and vocation may be perceived in their true light, end quote. The dignity and vocation of human beings comes from their creation in the image of God and possession of an immortal soul and are thereby called to communion with God. But also, this dignity is obscured by sin and the proper freedom attaching to it has been diminished by sin which hampers human beings in fulfilling their vocation to communion with God and with each other. When people look into their own hearts, it says, they find that they are drawn towards what is wrong and are sunk in many evils, which cannot have come from their good creator from chapter 13. Though atheism seems to exalt man, who is thereby seen to constitute his own end and his own soul maker, in total control of his own history, encouraged in this view by the technical mastery of nature made possible by modern science. In fact, atheism detracts from human dignity, which is impaired by loss of hope in eternal life, and which is not diminished by the acknowledgement of the creator, but rather is grounded and brought to perfection in God. The church, we're told, knows full well that its message is in harmony with the most secret desires of the human heart, since she championed the dignity of the human being's calling, giving hope once more to those who already despair of their higher destiny. And there's a lot of those around today. It is in the famous paragraph number 22 that the church's answer is more fully revealed. I had most fully revealed, but I think that's wrong. I think as these early chapters goes on, it becomes even more fully revealed, but chapter 22 is famous, quote, in reality, it is only in the mystery of the word made flesh that the mystery of man truly becomes clear. It is in Christ, the new Adam, that we see the fullness of human being and dignity, for he, in the very revelation of the mystery of the Father and of his love, fully reveals man to himself and brings to light his high calling. And I put the Latin there in the text, but I'm not going to read it. Because he is the son of the eternal father, who united to himself human nature and thus each and every one of us, because now each one of us can say with Paul, the son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Human dignity has been elevated to a dignity beyond compare. It could be said, I think, that in its elevation, human dignity is fully clarified for us. And to use an Irenaean word, a word that St. Irenaeus used, recapitulated. It is summed up in the last Adam, the new Adam, the new head of the human race. Those conformed to his image are able to fulfill the new law of love, Gaudimitz Bez tells us. That is, they are enabled to act more and more with the dignity property humanity and more and more to fulfill the human vocation of communion with God and with others in that very love which was revealed in the Paschal mystery. Such is the nature and the greatness of the mystery of man, we're told, as enlightened for the faithful by Christian revelation and this includes the mystery of suffering and death, which apart from his gospel overwhelms us. That's all from chapter 22. The light shed by Christ 
on the mystery of human being is also thereby shed on the social aspect of human life. For the word made flesh will to take his place in human society. And in so doing, he sanctified those human ties above all family ties, which are the basis of social structures, chapter 32. The communion of the church is invoked here as Lumen Gentium chapter nine describes it as a reflection and accomplishment of God's creative will. God did not create people to live as individuals, but to come together in social unity. And therefore, as Lumen Gentium 9 says, and is cited by Gaudi Mitzpez, he willed to save human beings, not as individuals without any bond between them, but rather to make them into a people. The social character of human nature is, quote, perfected and fulfilled in the work of Jesus Christ, who by his incarnation willed to take his place in human society and to sanctify its ordinary interpersonal bonds, such as those of the family, as mentioned. The church, one could say, recapitulates, and in doing that, fully reveals God's intentions for the communal character of human life. Not because the church is without corruption or has a perfect governmental structure, but because it is established by the gift of Christ's spirit, a new fraternal communion among all who received him in faith and love, his own body, the church. God of its best 32. Christ's spirit binding the church into communion or solidarity recapitulates the solidarity that is part of God's intentions for human creatures in the first place, and therefore provides perspective on all other claims to solidarity. From the perspective of this recapitulation, the solidarity already glimpsed in various forms of human community as an aspiration can be recognized as something which must be nurtured. This solidarity, it says, must be constantly increased until that day when it will be brought to fulfillment. Until the eschatological fulfillment of human solidarity, the church provides an anticipatory vision of human community and social life. And this is found in the principles of what is usually called Catholic social teaching. The council draws attention to the features of Catholic social teaching especially relevant to the problems of the modern world, namely the increasing global interdependence of peoples and thus an expanded sense of the common good, the essential equality of all human beings, the need to transcend a morality that is narrowly individualistic and above all and included as an element in all of these principles, respect for the dignity of the human person. There is in the modern world, quote, a growing awareness of the sublime dignity of human persons who stand above all things and whose rights and duties are universal and inviolable, end quote from 26. Okay, it is from this perspective of the recapitulation of man, homo, the human being in Christ, that the church wishes to engage in dialogue with the modern world, according to Gaudium et Spes. Although it is a commonplace to note that the Second Vatican Council wanted to foster dialogue between the church and the world of today, or as we have been talking about it, the modern world, it is less commonly noted, I think, that each of the four chapters that constitute part one of Gaudium et Spes all end on different aspects of the way in which Christ has recapitulated hum, human being and human history in himself and is therefore the starting point for any contribution that the church can make to dialogue. This dynamic then is not confined to section 22. In fact, <clears throat> it is explicitly named in the closing section of chapter three, which is number 38. The word of God through whom all things were made, became human and dwelt among us, a perfect human being. He entered world history, taking that history into himself 
and recapitulating it, end quote. So I think I'm right in finding, calling this dynamic a recapitulatory one after Irenaeus because the, the council uses that language itself. It is actually in chapter four that this recapitulatory dynamic and its connection to dialogue rises to a kind of crescendo. Quote, all we have said up to now about the dignity of the human person, the community of human beings, and the deep significance of human activity provides a basis for discussing the relationship between the church and the world and the dialogue between them, end quote. The perspective is drawn from Lumen Gentium and is frankly Augustinian. I know it's the Angelicum, but <laughs> it's still frankly Augustinian here, I think, with overt reference to the, the dynamic of the two cities, the way that members of the earthly city are called forth to form the family of the sons of God in the midst of history, quote, and the way the two cities are intermixed, or as it says, penetrate one another. The church is at once, quote, a visible organization and a spiritual community, citing Lumen Gentium 8. Could we say the sacrament of the heavenly city? Quote, in pursuing its own salvific purpose, not only does the church communicate divine life to man, but in a certain sense, it casts the reflected light of that divine life over all the earth, notably in the way it heals and elevates the dignity of the human person, strengthens the social bond, and endows daily activity with daily me deeper meaning from chapter 40, I mean from section 40. It can only cast this light of divine life because that life is the church's constitution in the spirit. So that the church, as a visible society, constituted by communion in a life it did not and could not give itself, is the presence of this life in the city of this world. It elevates the dignity of the human person, etc., then, not simply by its teaching or by the example of some of its members, but by its very presence within the world. It says that in section 41. It provides perspective on the unmitigated claims of the earthly city on the human being, insofar as it elevates human beings into a communion proceeding from the love of the eternal father. And that communion relativizes all worldly claims to defining the ideal community. And so serves as the soul of human society in its renewal by Christ. This recapitulatory dynamic means that, ironically, simply by being church and by teaching from her identity as such, the church, quote, through each of her members and her community as a whole can help make the human family and its history still more human, end quote. That's the recapitulatory part. Chapter four is very emphatic on this point. It goes on to mention, quote, that the church is entrusted with the task of manifesting to contemporaries the mystery of God, who is their final destiny. <clears throat> In so doing, it discloses to them the meaning of their own existence, the innermost truth about themselves. That's very beautiful. This is the solution to the crisis of modernity, namely, dialogue with the world on the basis of the mystery of the recapitulation of human being in Christ, both individually and communally. Quote, to follow Christ, the perfect human, is to become more human oneself, end quote. And that's very beautiful. This dynamic of dialogue based in recapitulation is magnificently recalled in the closing chapter the closing section of chapter four. Every benefit the people of God can confer on humanity during its earthly pilgrimage is rooted in the church's being the universal sacrament of salvation. That's from Lumen Gentium 7. At once manifesting 
and actualizing the mystery of God's love for humanity. The word of God, through whom all things were made, was made flesh, so that as a perfect man, he could save all human beings and sum up, recapitulare, all things in himself. End quote. Thus, <clears throat> to engage in dialogue from the heart of the gospel is, ironically, to engage in dialogue from the heart of the human being. And so to address the crisis of modernity concerning the status of the human being in terms that have an echo in every human heart, regardless of their faith. Okay, so now I'm, I'm making a transition to Pope John Paul II. Uh, I wanna try to show um, how he draws forward this trajectory or this legacy of, of Vatican II, especially from Gaudium et Spes. So now I'd like to turn to the work of Pope St. John Paul II to demonstrate his use of and his development of this paradigm for dialogue. To this end, I'd like to give some extended consideration to one of his greatest encyclical letters, at least I think so, the 1995 Evangelium Vitae, concerning one of the most contentious issues of the modern world, that of abortion and of other, other issues related to it. This letter operates in the tension between a doctrine that is accessible to reason, part of the natural law, and so something that could be discussed in civil society without appealing to religion, and yet one that can only be articulated with full force and clarity from the perspective of revelation. Yet the conviction that speaking from revelation is also speaking from the heart of humanity at its best, undergirds the confidence with which John Paul II regards the possibility of believers animating a conversation and renewing social life, drawing on the terms of revelation without at the same time insisting on imposing these terms as the only acceptable ones in which the issue can be discussed even in a secular society. So having laid out the terms in the first part of the talk of the recapitulatory dynamic in Gaudium et Spes, we can immediately notice it in Evangelium Vitae, where it was quite prominent. For instance, we read, quote, in Jesus, the word of life, God's eternal life is proclaimed and given. Thanks to this proclamation and gift, our physical and spiritual life also in its earthly phase acquire its full value and meaning. In this way, the gospel of life includes everything that human experience and reason tell us about the value of human life, accepting it, purifying it, exalting it, and bringing it to fulfillment." End quote. That's from section 30. Again, a little earlier in the text, we read, quote, that the gospel of life is something concrete and personal, for it consists in the proclamation of the very person of Jesus, through whom human beings are given the possibility of knowing the complete truth concerning the value of human life." End quote. It can be shocking to read in the same paragraph that nonetheless, it, it, that is the gospel of life, can also be known in its essential traits by human reason. The reason that this could be shocking is that it, it seems to make revelation superfluous. But this is not a zero sum competitive dynamic between revelation and reason, but rather it fits into the recapitulatory dynamic we have seen from Gaudium and Spes, meaning that though the essentials of the doctrine are part of natural law, and so can, at least in theory, be known by reason alone, the mystery of the person of Christ includes everything reason can know and further uplifts and fulfills and purifies it as noted above. And by the way, that's in Thomas, right? In the very first opening chapter of the Summa. 
quote, this is the gospel which already present in the revelation of the Old Testament and indeed written in the heart of every man and woman has echoed in every conscience from the beginning. So to preach the gospel of life, strictly speaking, means at the same time to evoke its echo in the human heart, where it is to some extent already present in reason alone. It is to recapitulate that echo, which does not mean to erase it or drown it out, but to uplift it precisely as the locus or plane of dialogue with modern secular man. This dynamic is even more evident uh, in Evangelium Vitae 2, so at the beginning. God reveals the supernatural vocation of the human being to a fullness of life which extends to eternity. And yet the church knows, quote, that this gospel of life, which she has received from her Lord, has a profound and pervasive echo in the heart of every person, believer and non-believer alike, because it marvelously fulfills all the heart's expecta expectations while infinitely surpassing them. That's very beautiful, I think. Everyone sincerely open to truth and goodness, the Pope says, can, quote, come to recognize in the natural law written in the human heart the sacred value of human life from its very beginning until its end and can affirm the right of every human being to have this primary good respected to the highest degree, end quote. In fact, recognition of this right is the foundation of human and political community. Believers are even more aware of this right because it is recapitulated in the proclamation of the incarnation. Recalling and actually citing Gaudium et Spes 22, John Paul notes that, quote, and this is a quote within a quote, so he's quoting Gaudium et Spes 22, by his incarnation, the Son of God has united himself in some fashion with every human being. That's the end of the quote within the quote. But John Paul II goes on, this saving event reveals to humanity not only the boundless love of God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, but also the incomparable value of every human person. Again, far from the erasure of what reason can see in the natural law, the church is able to invest this universal starting point with a new sense of wonder as she contemplates the mystery of the redemption. And yet there is a crisis. It is the same one acknowledged by Gaudium et Spes, quote, in the background, there is the profound, profound crisis of culture, John Paul says, which generates skepticism in relation to the very foundations of knowledge and ethics in which it makes it increasingly difficult to grasp clearly the meaning of what man is, end quote. This is an echo of Gaudium et Spes' focus on the crisis of the meaning and value of the human being. We also see this, the same exact crimes against life and human dignity that were pointed out at Gaudium et Spes 27. I didn't quote that passage repeated and cited in Evangelium Vitae 3, from abortion to torture, to slavery, the selling of women and children, to disgraceful working conditions, etc. According, according to Gaudium et Spes, and recalled by John Paul here, these poison human society. And the church can proclaim this, because the revelation in Christ of the sublime dignity of the human person, injured and clouded by sin, but restored and elevated as recapitulated in Christ, can explain modern man to himself, can explain how these poisons can arise, even though there is a natural knowledge available regarding the dignity of the human person and the sacredness of life, and can explain then how, quote, Conscience itself, darkened as it were by widespread conditioning, is finding it increasingly difficult 
to distinguish between good and evil in what concerns the basic value of human life, end quote. So John Paul is no artificial optimist that you can just look in and see um, unclouded by the natural knowledge of the dignity of the human person because it's been clouded over by sin. In a situation where the crisis of modernity has become, quote, an enormous and dramatic clash between good and evil, death and life, the culture of death and the culture of life, end quote, it is the revelation of man to himself in Christ that clarifies the situation. It is the blood of Christ, specifically, that reveals man to himself, <clears throat> poured out on account of sin, and so revealing <clears throat> the depth of human depravity. It also, quote, reveals the grandeur of the Father's love, <clears throat> excuse me, shows how precious man is in God's eyes and how priceless the value of his life. Evangelium Vitae 27, 25. It is in contemplating the precious blood of Christ, quote, the sign of his self-giving love, that the believer learns to recognize and appreciate the almost divine dignity of every human being. Finally, Christ's blood is truly the key to the riddle of the human being, modern or otherwise, since Christ's blood reveals to man that his greatness and therefore his vocation consists in the sincere gift of self. This is a direct echo and development of Gaudium at Space 24, which talks about how the revelation of the Trinity through the Incarnate's words teaching, quote, has opened up new horizons closed to human reasoning by indicating that there is a certain similarity existing between the, between the union existing among the divine persons and the union of God's children in truth and love. It follows that human beings can fully discover their true selves only in sincere self-giving, end quote. That's beautiful. So then you might be thinking, what's the point? <laughs> Though it seems an irony, the fact that the recapitulation of human being in solidarity in Christ grounds the conviction of human dignity more firmly in specifically Christian faith which might seem to narrow the possibilities for dialogue with an unbelieving world. In fact, following the pattern laid out in God Imit Spes, it actually increases those possibilities. This is precisely because revelation is recapitulatory. It does not erase <clears throat> the primordial common ground that human reason, at least in theory, can see on its own, but strengthens it, clarifies it, purifies it and uplifts it. It does not take away the common territory, as it were, in which dialogue in a secular or modern culture can take place, but increases the possibilities for dialogue in just that space. Christian conviction does not shut down dialogue with a my way or the highway insistence on the acceptance of revelation as the only acceptable terms of discussion. But John Paul says, is in fact, quote, capable of bringing about a serious and courageous cultural dialogue among all parties, end quote. Toward the end of what he says calls a general mobilization of consciences and a united ethical effort, end quote, from chapter 95. How does this work? Revelation enables us believers to see more deeply into the sacredness of human life, something that all people have and have had access to from the beginning. Contemplating the offer of sharing the life of God eternally, which we receive in Christ, quote, believers cannot fail to be filled with ever new wonder and unbounded gratitude. And the recapitulatory effect means that this wonder and gratitude draws into its orbit the natural life 
which is the seed of the eternal life won in Christ's victory. Emphasizing and extending a passage I previously quoted, quote, precisely by contemplating the precious blood of Christ, the sign of his self-giving love, the, the believer learns to recognize and appreciate the almost divine dignity of every human being and can exclaim with ever renewed wonder how precious must man be in the eyes of the creator if he gains so great a redeemer from the exultet. The believer is filled with awe and wonder at the genesis of life in procreation. And this awe and wonder extends even to the whole natural world, our common home, as Pope Francis has recently put it, in which our bodily human life takes place. Our meditation on the pierced one draws forth praise and thanksgiving for the sacrifice of Christ, and thereby for the humanity that he took up, our humanity, is drawn within the orbit of this thanksgiving. And at the outset of the encyclical, we read that, quote, the church, faithfully contemplating the mystery of the redemption, acknowledges the incomparable value of every human person with ever new wonder, end quote. The renewed appreciation of the dignity of the human person as recapitulated in Revelation also casts light and helps to characterize the characteristic offense to that dignity prevalent in modern culture. It is one that denies solidarity, the very solidarity we have seen uplifted in Gaudi Mitzbez. And in many cases, this denial takes the form of a veritable culture of death. Though this is a rather dramatic way of putting it, culture of death, we can analyze the essential features of this culture of death. It is, the encyclical says, actively fostered by powerful cultural, economic, and political currents, which encourage an idea of society excessively concerned with efficiency, end quote, which turns out to be one excessively concerned with power, one that therefore victimizes the weak, the vulnerable, those who lack autonomy. This in turn attacks the basis of democracy and democratic freedom, since freedom is degraded to an individualism the freedom of the strong against the weak who have no choice but to submit. This is a threat jeopardizing the very meaning of democratic coexistence and dissolving its solidarity because it becomes a benefit extended only to the powerful. Another way of characterizing the culture of death is that it prioritizes having over being, which echoes Gaudium et Spes 35, quote, people are of greater value for what they are than for what they have, end quote, but not in the culture of death, it's the other way around. And this in turn goes hand in hand, that is prioritizing having over being, goes hand in hand with prioritizing efficiency over persons. Quote, the values of being are replaced by those of having. The so-called quality of life is interpreted primarily or exclusively as economic efficiency, Evangelion Vitae 23 or even more forcefully, quote, the criterion of personal dignity, which demands generosity, respect, and service is replaced by the criterion of efficiency, functionality, and usefulness. Others are considered not for what they are, but for what they have, do, and produce. This is the supremacy of the strong over the weak, end quote. This includes, especially and above all, the poor. There is provided here the basis for cultural renewal through dialogue, because the cultivation of wonder and gratitude for human life correlated as JP2 does with the philosophically articulated values, prioritizing being over having and person over efficiency can be engaged without overt reference to revelation even if revelation is the source of the believer's ever new wonder and gratitude and of his or her clearer seeing of the priority of being over having and person over efficiency. In the last chapter of, Gaudimitz, of Evangelium Vitae, calling for cultural renewal and dialogue, the encyclical notes, we can say that the cultural change which we are calling for demands from everyone 
the courage to adopt a new lifestyle, consisting in making practical choices at the personal, family, social, and interpersonal international level on the basis of a correct scale of values, the primacy of being over having, of person over things. Note that this is demanded from everyone, and it is assumed that everyone, regardless of faith, can understand the values named here. This is because these values are written in the human heart, however obscured by sin and by cultures formed in sinful practices. There is nothing in them that depends on accepting revelation. A modern pluralistic secular culture can understand wonder and gratitude, even if the culture on its own is not enough to sustain it, because the question has to arise, gratitude to whom? For what? But requires the leaven of the church, the sacrament of the city of God, to diagnose the problem and to illuminate and engage in persuasive dialogue about these values in order to awaken consciences. We find Pope Francis calling for the same thing some 30 years later and now in Gaudium in Laudato Si. A democratic society has the ability and resources to engage in thinking about its own foundations in respect for persons, even if the ultimate grounding for that respect is not fully available to reason alone. And yet the terms can be understood and what is at stake can be grasped while the democratic values and, practice, and practices of wonder and gratitude, of preferring being over having and persons over efficiency can be taken up in partnership with believers. It will be possible for believers to argue in, and to engage in this way, precisely because they are not relying only on the resources of reason alone, but on the renewal and recapitulation of human being accomplished in Christ. From there flows a clear-sighted diagnosis of the problem, but even more importantly, a ready flowing gratitude and wonder, which is ready precisely out of gratitude to be conformed to the self-giving love of Christ and to undertake the kinds of sacrifices that will be necessary to inspire a dialogue that is more than words. In Jesus, the law available to reason, but which on its own, can seem to dwindle to an obligation imposed externally and so to invite limitation and mitigation. He says that in 48. The law, quote, becomes once and for all the gospel, the good news of God's lordship over the world. And through the figure of the servant of the Lord fulfilled in Jesus, we are given a new heart, which, quote, will make it possible to appreciate and achieve the deepest and most authentic meaning of life namely that of being a gift which is fully realized in the giving of self, end quote. More emphatically, the same contemplation of the precious blood of Christ that prompts us to grateful wonder also because it reveals to man in a recapitulatory way that his greatness and therefore his vocation consists in the seer gift of self, it is precisely from the blood of Christ that all draw the strength to commit themselves to promoting life. There is no cultural renewal without sacrificial witness. But this is part of the priestly, prophetic, and royal vocation of the baptized. So promoting a culture of dialogue means promoting among believers a culture of self-giving sacrifice. And not necessarily in big ways, but in all those daily gestures of openness, sacrifice, and unselfish care, which countless people lovingly make in families, hospitals, orphanages, homes for the elderly, and other centers or communities, which defend life. This is the substance of cultural renewal and out of which dialogue comes. There is no cultural renewal on the cheap and no dialogue on the cheap, but out of a truly self-giving witness, consistent, and thick in its many manifestations and venues, engagement in dialogues about the democratic values of being over having and persons over efficiency can emerge and touch consciences and has the potential of renewing democracy itself in the awe and wonder at the gift of human life and the dignity of the human person. In conclusion, it's worth mentioning that this recapitulatory dynamic and its power to engender witness that can serve as a wellspring for dialogue 
that operates within the terms accessible to reason alone is rather movingly present in the 1993 encyclical Veritatis Splendor, which begins with a citation of Gaudium et Spes 22. And we have seen that the recapitulatory dynamic is by no means confined to that one paragraph in Gaudium et Spes. After its introduction, we find it, this recapitulatory dynamic, operative throughout Veritatis Splendor. But when the discussion turns to martyrdom, we find a particularly sublime version of this dynamic, I think anyway. Christ's witness to the truth that human freedom is lived most deeply in the gift of self, even to the total gift of self like that of Jesus, is the source, model, and means for the witness of the disciples. This is from section 89, which from the earliest times until today has borne fruit in martyrdom. Christ's martyrdom and the martyrdom of his disciples, who in a way make Christ's martyrdom present now, cast light on the natural law that is part and parcel of human nature and accessible to reason alone. The relationship between faith and morality, John Paul says, quote, shines forth with all its brilliance in the unconditional respect due to the insistent demands of the personal dignity of every man, of every human being. He continues, the universality of the moral norm make manifest and at the same time serve to protect the personal dignity and inviolability of man. He then argues that the unacceptability of ethical theories that deny the existence of negative moral norms that are universally binding is, quote, confirmed in a particularly eloquent way by Christian martyrdom, which has always accompanied and continues to accompany the life of the church today, from section 90. We recognize what we have been calling the recapitu recapitulatory uplifting and purification of that which is most human, that which all human beings share, including here the natural law itself. Perhaps an unexpected, unexpected result is that Christ's martyrdom and Christian martyrdom formed in Christ's pattern shines a light on the heroism of others who are not Christian and who come from various traditions and cultures. The Pope continues, quote, in this witness to the absoluteness of the moral good, Christians are not alone. They're supported by the moral sense present in peoples and by the great religious and sapiential traditions of East and West from which the interior workings of God's spirit are not absent, end quote, number 30, 94. The recapitulatory character of this recognition of the heroism of non-Christians is absolutely clear here, quote, in an individual's words and above all in the sacrifice of his life for a moral value, the church sees a single testimony to that truth which, already present in creation, shines forth in its fullness on the face of Christ, end quote. And he invokes Justin Martyr's characterization of the hatred and destruction some of the Stoics faced for their teaching. <clears throat> Thus, the heroic witness to the moral law by persons of different religions and cultures offers a way for dialogue to take place about that law. Dialogue which helps reveal its meaning and its appeal to those without, benef without the benefit of Christ's revelation. <clears throat> In other words, to a secular modern world. <clears throat> it can take the form of dialogue precisely about this heroism. And most interestingly, the natural law itself is revealed in this way as offering a theoretization of intercultural and interreligious admiration. Surely that is a wonderful path for communication and dialogue in the modern world, a world which seems so closed off to something seemingly so narrow and intransigent as the universally binding character of the negative precepts of the moral law. All of a sudden, dialogue means leveraging the admiration for human heroism that we do all feel. It's not so hidden in the human heart. 
And it occurs, we know, even across the boundaries of cultures that are sometimes portrayed in a postmodern world as incommensurable barriers to human understanding. In this light, John Paul II appears as a faithful and brilliantly creative interpreter of the dialogical imperative of the Second Vatican Council and its grounding in the light of the nations, that is Christ, that light that shines on the church as the seed of the new humanity and from there on the whole world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for that impressive lecture, which shows us how deeply the thought of John Paul II is rooted in the Second Vatican Council consideration on human nature and natural law. Thank you very much for that. And of course, talking about uh, uh, Second Vatican Council, it's uh, not easy to avoid some question on the reforms uh, which uh, started from that very point. Uh, let me ask some questions we, we found among our listeners. Uh, uh, first one is that in the today Catholic Church, there are clearly two different views on the Second Vatican Council reforms. One side argues that the Council's reforms have gone too far, that changes must be stopped or even reversed. The other side argues that the Council stopped halfway, that further rapprochement with the world is necessary, or as it is sometimes said, that the new Council is necessary. Uh, the first question is, uh, which of these two views would be closer to St. John Paul II if he could look at this problem from today's perspective? And second, which interests me very much, is what of these two opinions is closer to you, John? Okay. Thanks for the easy question. <laughs> so I, I think I tried to set the paper up to answer that question. <laughs> um, it's not, it, it's not exactly. Yeah, it's not exactly an easy. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I do. So I think with regard to those that say the reforms have gone too far, okay, I'm not, I, I'm not going to necessarily talk about specific reforms, but I think the ones who say that the reforms have gone too far are likely to think that we've yielded too much to the modern world. So in the dialogue, we've granted too much. Um, I guess you could say it's too optimistic. There's, it, it underestimates the um, corrosive and anti-Christian, anti anti-sentiments uh, of the modern world. And so we've given in too much to that. And the, um, the other side, the council stopped halfway uh, and didn't, didn't go far enough towards dialogue, et cetera, I think is, um, yeah, is, um, is just that. It's saying that it not only didn't it give away too much, but it, it, didn't, um, it didn't take root enough. It didn't reform enough so that, for example, um, we, we even stop necessarily imposing the Nicene Creed on different cultures, et cetera. So I tried to write the paper to show that according to the Vatican Council, these two things are related. So the uniqueness of revelation is uncompromised here, it seems. And I chose Gaudium et Spes 
because it's that document, I think, which is usually the point of controversy, right? It went too far or, uh, or, or didn't give away enough yet. And so I, I chose that one because I wanted to show that I think, I think many people underestimate how much it didn't give away. That is how rooted it is in the primary revelation of Jesus Christ and its uniqueness and its indispensability. But I also tried to show how that very uniqueness, as the, as the council do, shows it, um, implies or demands an openness to dialogue because it recapitulates what's human in all of us. And so it kind of um, brings to the fore, in a sense, though from its own perspective, humanity, it says, right, which is obscured by sin. So you need revelation to be able to diagnose this and talk about it. And yet at the same time, the dialogue with contemporary culture doesn't have to go on exclusively in the terms of revelation. So I tried to show that, um, that in some ways there's a balance there. And I think you might argue that certain reforms went too far in one way and certain reforms didn't go far enough. It's, it's, it's um, you know, not necessarily, I think, the same across the board. And is the new council necessary it may be necessary, but it's not because it didn't go far enough. Think about the, um, the first ecumenical council, the Council of Nicaea. Ecumenical councils that, that actually do something and do something rather deep, they always, they always have a need for interpretation. That was true of Nicaea, which there was 60 years of con controversy and debate before the meaning of the homoousion was finally fully clarified. Um, so it's it's not surprising if a council would need another event of authoritative interpretation, but that's not because the council didn't go far enough, um, I don't think. Um, mm -hmm. And which, which would John Paul II have? I think that, that John, the, so the legacy of John Paul II becomes contested here. That's why I did this, because I think um, the ones who are going to say that the council stopped halfway are likely to say that John Paul retarded the spirit of the council and, you know, set it back. So he's part of the reason it didn't go all the way. But the ones who say it went too far are the ones who are going to say, you know, John Paul II engaged in too much into religious dialogue. And um, even his dialogue with the Jews, which I think is one of the most important legacies of his papacy, um, went too far um, and gave too much away. And what I wanted to try to show is that John Paul II, far from retarding the council or far from um, giving away too much, tried to strike that balance of a kind of utter re reliance on the uniqueness of revelation that's uncompromising, which is the source then of dialogue because without it, without the uniqueness of revelation, nobody sees human nature clearly enough. It's obscured by sin. It's obscured by our own sin. It's obscured by sinful conditioning. Consciences are dark. So you need it to diagnose the situation. You also need it to provide, you might say, the jumpstart for renewal, because renewal isn't going to come just from talk. Renewal is going to come from people's willingness to make sacrifices, and that's got to start with those who are grateful for the precious blood of Christ. Um, that precious blood, which is unique, irreplaceable, and, and plenipotentiary. So we have that, and that's supposed to be the beginning of our own um, witness, our own willingness to give ourselves and to create a kind of you know, Christian communion in which that kind of sacrifice, and that is the basis of cultural renewal and the basis of dialogue. But it is the basis of dialogue, right? We don't, we don't insist in a secular culture, well, we're not going to talk unless you convert, or we're not going to talk unless you use our language. No, there is the domain that's accessible to reason alone. It's more accessible to Christians, ironically, because of this recapitulation of human nature in Christ, but a conversation is possible. Um, 
So I, what I wanted to show is that John Paul II is trying to steer this, I think, what is right, this middle course um, between giving away too much and not, not going forward enough. Um, and I think, you know, that's not a comfortable place, really, because it is the place of not mere words, but of the call for renewal in sacrifice, but it's also not a comfortable place because we're not simply saying convert. The dialogue can't just be proselytizing. Otherwise, there's no dialogue. So that's not a comfortable place, but that's the place, that's the place that we're called to take up as Christians, and I think that's the place the Lord took up. Um, it wasn't so comfortable. It wasn't so comfortable for St. Paul. Um, yeah, who went on who went on to the area Apagus and said, this is the one you've been looking for, but you had a glimpse and you now you can recognize him most fully. So I don't know, it's not comfortable. And I I think I think myself, it asks about me. Um, I admire this balance very much, and I don't feel I've kept it all the time. I don't feel that every theologian has kept it all the time, and I don't feel that um, every, you know. Reform has necessarily, in the specifics, kept it all the time. But I also want to say it's hard. It's not easy. And it doesn't surprise me if, you know, in certain ways, certain things have to be recalibrated over time. That's human being. Does that help? Thank you, John. Thank you. That's a very precise answer. Thank you very much. Uh, second question is something connected with the idea of standing between the two radical answers. Um, um, because we consider two of the um, last popes uh, as very similar from that point of view. But the difference between the pontificate of um, St. John Paul II and Benedict XVI, one of the difference, was their distinct attitudes uh, toward um, Society of some Pius the Tenth, so-called Lefebris. So-called what? what? Uh, so that, that they differ, they have a distinct attitude toward the Society of some Pius Pius Tenth, so-called Lefebris. Uh, what right, was? I, I still didn't understand. A, a difference bet between society between the attitudes. Uh, yeah, of Benedict uh, XVI and John Paul II yes. toward so-called Lefebris. That's, toward, that's what I don't get. Towards what? Uh, the, the, the society of St. Pius X. Oh, St. Pius X. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. What was the reason for John Paul II uh, more restrictive approach uh, uh, toward that society. You know, that's that's not something really I know enough about to comment on. I mm -hmm. feel any comment I would make would come more from ignorance than from knowledge. So I, you know, I just I just don't know. Uh -huh. Because in Poland, it's a very it's an important topic. In Poland, it's a very important topic for us. Uh, because we, let's say, treat Benedict as a very close, uh, in the, from the theological point of view, to the John Paul II, but uh, we have a good reason for that, and that, that, that is a strong and in, important difference. Um, okay, so let's leave that question and let's pass to the other one, which I'm sorry is a little bit political, but... Uh, still very important from the um, Polish perspective. I'm sorry, <laughs> we are Poles and um, philosophical society, so that's... Um, in Poland, we have increasing pressure uh, today to weaken the Catholic uh, teaching, uh, which is connected with condemning abortion. Uh, some argue that this is a kind of a special obsession of the Catholic Church in Poland, uh, obsessive heritage of John Paul II. 
so the, in the light of tradition and particularly the teaching of the second Vatican Council on human dignity, is it possible to agree to a kind of a relativization of the sin of abortion? Is it possible? Yeah. Um, well, my answer, my, my simple answer to that is no, it's not possible to agree to that because I think that, that, that the direct taking of an innocent human life is contrary to human dignity, period. And, and if, you, if you relativize it, you relativize the value on which democracy is built because once you start relativizing human dignity, you valorize power. Like who's more powerful then is worth more. So relativizing the sin of abortion, I think is, is relativizing human dignity. I would say, however, that, you know, that's, that's the kind of moral absolute. In terms of the church, you know, the church has a pastoral approach to, to people who've had an abortion, for instance. Um, you know, the church doesn't say, we don't want to hear from you anymore. The church has a kind of approach um, that's pastoral to, to um, you know, to help somebody heal from having done that or, or something. So there's, there's ways in which in any sin, the guilt of it can, um, is mitigated by circumstance, just even if the objective evil is not relativized. Um, so it's not as though, um, it, it's, it doesn't relativize the objective evil to be able to talk about what might you know, make it so, so a woman feels like she has no choice. I know this, it's often called pro-choice, but often women feel they have no choice, actually. Um, and so why? And how can those circumstances be mitigated? So you're working on some of these other you know, life issues, like, um, like, like healthcare, et cetera, so that that's not a separate conversation. But at the same time, I don't think it justifies, and it doesn't. It can't justify the taking of an innocent human life. Um, mm -hmm. But, but it's but the but the church's position is less credible if that's if that's the only thing it talks about, instead of all the other things that seem to me that you know are 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 ordered towards helping women and towards helping families um, be able to receive life more easily. So I think that's how I'd answer that. Hey John, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I pass the question to Dominique Holtz. Dominique, do you want to ask a question to Professor Joe Cavadini? Hi, um, one, one thing I think that might be helpful perhaps one is to, to picture this might be, um, we always find that, that figures are um, taken out of a particular experience and, and the experience of John Paul II's Poland um, was I mean, in 2021, a very different place and even a very different Europe, a different project in a way globally. Um, are there, um, how does that dynamic play out and how we might translate some of his insights about dialogue? What dialogue might look like in say, you know, 1985, where the world was, right? How does that translate after the fall of the Berlin Wall, after the shift of, of what say, the, the dialogue about Islam in Europe? And these are all very different things that one wouldn't have heard of at all in, in a Europe where things were different, more people were going to church, right? So there was a, so d does that, does that play into how we can receive or how we have to, to trans uh, translate uh, some of, of his insight? Yeah, thanks. Um, now I hesitate to comment on Europe because I'm an American and one thing about Americans, except for you, is <laughs> that we, we tend to impose our views everywhere and assume that they're everybody. So I, um, I, 
I'm really hesitant to talk about Europe too much, but I, I'll, I'll say one thing, I think. Um, if you read some of John Paul II's you know, apostolic exhortations like Pastores, Pastores Dabo Lobus, for instance, um, he talks about the contemporary situation in which priests are being trained there. Um, and he talks about you know, the, um, the failure of ideologies and so as a you know, kind of an uptick, like a good sign that um, the Berlin Wall, you know, the Soviet, all these like ideologies have failed and fallen. Um, and so that's like uh, provides an opening. But from our perspective, actually, the ideologies are very operative in our world now without their institutional backing. Um, China is a is a great example of how in some ways they've, they, they're, they're um, you know, they're reinvigorated. Uh, and, and also, uh, atheism, we find out that um, North American and Western European democracies are perfectly capable of nurturing atheism. Um, and so we, we, we have this situation of a, of a culture that's more aggressively secular, I think, than, and I think one sign of the times there with even diminished participation in, in the church is that I think the church, like it, it, we have to, I think, learn our own faith and our own values, I guess, more deeply ourselves. Um, and I think we have, to, we have to form people so they really are willing to, you know, like Francis says, become missionary disciples. That is, and that doesn't mean just talking. That means, you know, making these sacrifices. There's, there's not going to be any dialogue that sticks, and there's not going to be any renewal unless we decide it's not just their problem, it's us. And we need to, we need to respond to the precious blood of Christ more lovingly, more gratefully, with more wonder, to teach it to our kids better, to form each other in it, and to, you know, to, to thereby sort of, I'm not saying create, you know, everybody's got to become St. Dominic <laughs> or, or Francis, but, you know, the little way, I think, I think, think Therese's little way, um, which in our culture was adopted by Dorothy Day, you know, this kind of thing does provide a, a basis for credibility and being able to say stuff that otherwise is going to fall on deaf ears, I think. So I think that would be the one thing I would say. It, it, it highlights the importance of evangelization, of catechesis, of formation, not just abstractly, but in these doctrines insofar as they form hearts and inspire witness. That's what I would say. Great, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to uh, John, uh, Professor John Cavardini for accepting our invitation to the Institute of Culture of San John Paul II in Angelicum. Thank, thank you very you. much for your enlightening lecture. Thank you very much, Dominic Holtz uh, and um, our Department of Philosophy. Um, thank you very much to Carol Grabius from uh, San Nicolas Foundation who coordinate uh, uh, today lecture and our meeting. Uh, I would like to uh, invite you uh, for the next lecture from the series of JP2 lecture, uh, which will be called Political Theology from St. Thomas Aquinas to St. John Paul II and Benedict XVI. Uh, by delivered by which will be delivered by Father Francis Daguer, Dominican, uh, who will uh, which will take place on twenty four uh, March at uh, two thirty p.m. Thank you very much again. Um, thank you to our uh, lecturer and our audience, and we'll see soon again. And thank, thank you, you very much. much.